Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to Nor Shipping and the Blue Talks here in the Blue Economy Hall. These are, as I said yesterday, a series of one-hour kind of market insights that have uh, been shaped into a kind of chat show format where I'm bringing onto the stage 
Over the course of today and tomorrow and a little bit yesterday, experts to discuss and debate various key topics as we examine the transition of the shipping, maritime, and ocean space. So it's a lot of different discussions that I'm hosting over the course of these two and a half days. But one of the key ones today is we're going to assess something that is growing in importance. I think everybody's heard about life cycle assessments. Everyone's heard about circular economy. It's a growing topic. But how is this fitting into the shipping and ocean space? There are a lot of different elements that we're going to try and address. So in this one hour, I've invited six experts to come and join us and discuss what this means for the maritime space, what it means for the shipping space, both from shipping companies, technology companies, everybody who's involved in the space. So I've known Christopher Rex for quite a long time, and he's quite an outspoken voice about where he thinks shipping should go in the future. So I thought, who better to kind of look at the future of shipping from a life cycle, circular economy perspective than to invite Christopher Rex from uh, Danish Ship Finance. So Christopher, please, if you could come up to the floor and offer us your opening thoughts. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me. My name is Christopher Rex, and I'm head of innovation and research at Danish Ship Finance. I've been invited to kick off a discussion on how the circular economy is likely to reshape the shipping industry in the coming decades alongside the decarbonization of the global economy. But before we get too involved into the discussions of the circular economy, we need to ask ourselves, why now? We all know that the shipping industry is working hard to reduce CO2 emissions, and the same is the case for many other of the industries. To deliver on these ambitions, massive changes will need to happen, not just for shipping, but globally. The shipping industry accounts for 3% of global CO2 emission. That clearly leaves 97% of emissions to other industries. How will seaborne trade volumes and trading patterns develop when we begin to decarbonize the 97% of global emissions? The introduction of circular material flows and carbon accounting is likely to reshape the shipping industry, not just in terms of carbon cargo volumes and parcel sizes, but also in terms of trading patterns and value creation. Many of the players representing the 97% of global CO2 emissions are reporting ambitious targets to reduce emissions towards 2030 and towards 2050. They are basically learning to reduce not only scope one, but also two and three emissions. They are aiming to be able to do more with less. Material, products, and design innovations are applied across multiple industries to reduce scope one, two, and three emissions and allow, and allow more materials and products to be reused. The amount of material uh, used and transported is, li is likely to reduce along the lines of introducing new materials and changes to production locations and material, material life cycles. We are already seeing these trends playing out across multiple industries. We all have discussed in the past the car industry and the mining, and the mining industries, but we see it in many more places than these two industries. Circular material flows will be working to minimize material yield losses Seaborne trade volumes are likely to become more regional. Trading patterns and parcel sizes will change. We simply expect fewer volumes to be shipped on shorter distances and less virgin materials and fossil fuels to be shipped. The impact on the shipping industry is expected to be massive. The introduction of new environmental regulation, new fuels, and green corridors are increasing the need for long-term planning in the shipping industry. This is likely to change value drivers and business models. Today, we all know that most value is created from buying and selling vessels. The nature of the asset game disincentivizes large-scale upgrades of existing vessels and prevents more innovative thinking also on new building programs. Investments with long repayment periods are almost impossible to fully capitalize prematurely. This needs to change for the shipping industry to decarbonize. 
To reduce the shipping industry's environmental footprint, we will need to see a shift from a business model where value is created, created by the asset game to a model where value is created by operating the vessel. So we need to begin to discuss the cash flow yield rather than hoping to see second-hand values increasing. When we begin to see this shift towards long-term planning uh, and operation of the vessel rather than waiting for the next asset play, we are likely to see much more long-term planning that includes circular maintenance and circular, economy, circular economic principles in general. Thank you very much for the intention. Uh, I look forward to, um, to a thought-provoking discussion with my fellow panelists and hope you all have a great time for the next 50 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christopher. <laughs> you've, you've, you've talked quite often, and I heard this today, about this asset play, and it's one of the structural elements of the shipping, international shipping, is how ship owners use ships as assets, sellable assets, their financial instruments, yeah. to a large extent. And your argument here is that has to be a rethink yes. on exactly. how that, how do you, what kind of, you mentioned the sort of end of the asset play in, in some respects, but what kind of structure do you think shipping needs to move towards so that that circular discussion can be a real discussion, so there isn't that risk of, hey, I've, I'm done with this asset, I'm going to sell it because the market's good for me to get a return. First of all, if we ask ourselves, could we reduce the shipping industry's CO2 emissions already today, and could we upgrade the vessels beyond what has already been done? I think all of us would agree, agree that the answer is clearly yes, it could be done. But the difficult part here is, that most players, at least in the tramp owners, it's a little bit less outspoken am among liner companies and short key shipping players. But for the deep sea tramp owners, these guys are always waiting for the next uptick in, second -hand, in, in, in freight rates and in second hand values, allowing them to earn a, a high return on invested capital. So many of the abatement potential investments have significantly longer repayment periods than one year or one and a half or two years, whatever, whatever you can persuade a charterer to, to buy into. So these upgrades are simply not done in today's market, at least it is done significantly less than what we would like to see. Mm. So we need to begin to stop with this very short-term planning, only thinking about what can be repaid within 12 months, 26 months, and move towards what is the best version of the shipping industry we can imagine, and how can we minimize uh, CO2 emissions and bunker consumption. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good, I'm glad you came up here, Elizabeth. By the way, actually, I might as well get the rest of the panel up here now, because this is a good chance for me to introduce Elizabeth from Sintef, and Fanny Fabricius by from uh, Export Finance, Dewey, who's come from uh, Garmin Shipyard, and uh, come in the there's John <laughs> standing in from GMS. Now, just to put this into perspective, just before I go to you, Elizabeth, Dewey represents shipbuilders. So that's from the cradle. This is from the very concept of the vessel. So I'm going to be talking to her about how you design circularity into a ship right from the beginning. John represents, for me, the sort of the ship recycling element, <clears throat> that grave element, although obviously we're not going to talk about it from grave because it's recycling. So when you recycle a vessel, obviously the word recycling, there's a key clue there for what that, what that happens there. Fanny from Fabricus by basically, if you, if you understand how these incentives need to be played out and what we need to be considering. So I'm going to be drawing on her expertise in having that discussion about what we can do. A bit touching on what um, Christopher said about what we do with the vessels. And then from Reflow, we've got Rasmus. Now, Reflow is a company that is helping companies deal with their scope one, scope two, scope three emissions, as well as understanding the true circularity of the products they go. They've got customers that are engaged in rubber recycling, for example, and other industries. But when you look at their scope three, that's when the shipping industry comes in. So how is that going to be impacting the shipping industry? So through them, we're going to try and get a true discussion about what circularity means. But now, going back to you, Elizabeth, if I can. Yeah, I, I want to pick up about this asset play because very often we are saying that the ship owners, they are just into shipping for asset mm. play. But in reality, the biggest challenge is those which you borrowed the money from. Because they want to, to finance standardized ships. I remember uh, working on some project for Klovnes nearly 20 years ago. And then the discussion was always that if you wanted to build a more advanced ship, 
you would have to put in all the extra money yourself because the, the banks, they want to borrow out to, to standardize ships. And last time we had the new shipping event, it was a side event at the Norwegian Ship Owners Association. And then the banks was there, all the major ship owners from all over the world was there. And the first thing they said to, to DNB, the big bank, was that ah, you are just looking into go, uh, what it's like at the theater. You're not really interested in financing the good ships. So, good. so that gives me a kind of go to you then, Fanny, a little mm -hmm. bit from the, the kind of incentives. How do we change that? How do you look at, and let's not look at the new ships here, but let's, let's start with what we've got already in the fleet. How do we make sure that the, what we've got is fit for purpose, but still part of the transition? Um, I'm thinking it it's, would be very good if the ship owners would start to not only like to order new vessels, but to look at the possibilities of rebuilding, uh, for example, vessels which already exist or do retrofit uh, and not only going for, for the, new, uh, the new vessels. Um, uh, and there's actually, if I can take an example, um, today we have quite an uh, enormous amount of um, service vessels to the oil and gas industry in layup, um, approximately around a thousand vessels um, um, not working. And there's been a, a study done within the green ship financing program looking at the possibilities of um, rebuilding those vessels to um, for other purposes, for example, to the um, offshore wind sector, where there's a, a really big demand these days. And uh, it, if you take um, the, the study, which was led by Andreas Buskov from Vard, uh, it, if you take a 10-year perspective, um, actually um, rebuilding a, a service vessel um, will uh, result in less CO2 emissions and um, the possibility for introduction of new technology, uh, which is very important in this transition period now, and it's also economically more viable, which means that we will be interested in financing it. So to have the ship owners to, to, to take that responsibility and not always go for, for to have the brand new, I think that would be very important. Yeah. Christopher. I just had a comment. I completely share your views that banks would like to have standardized assets. But I think the, the key element here is that we would like to be able to sell it if there's something went wrong. So for sure it is, it will be. I appreciate the argument, but uh, we need, we need, I think we need to, towards standardization and scale of new, new designs becoming more, uh, becoming more mainstream before we can. Yeah, I, 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 f I think that if we in the end could end up with a taxonomy which yes. really rewards you for building the ships which use uh, least yes. fuel, have the lowest emissions, and can stay in business for 30, 35, or 40 years, then we have really done something very good. Yeah. At the moment, I'm a little bit afraid that we might end up with yeah. a taxonomy which doesn't help doesn't, us. Doesn't help, doesn't help. Yeah. Rasmus. Yeah, I think that's really, really interesting, but I think how would we know if life prolonging or retrofitting is the right idea if we don't have data on it? I think one of the biggest uh, issues that we have right now is we are assuming a lot of things. We should do like you mentioned with the car industry, Christopher, is let's start looking at the life cycle of the vessel. Let's start becoming data driven and get the numbers in and then start looking at which is the right way to go if we want to take the environment in. How do you see that actually happening? In, because you can get the data, but do you know you've got all of the data? Because I can collect the data. If I'm a ship owner, I've got certain elements that I'm collecting. I may only get the data of what's coming out of the funnel. So there's my reportable emissions that I've got under the MRV or the, or the DSC, for example. So those, that's the kind of data I have to report. But you're, you're looking at this also from the cargo owner's perspective, when they may need to get the data about their whole uh, scope 3 emissions. I think scope 3 emissions is all the emissions from a ship owner, right? That turns right. into the scope 3 emissions of the cargo owner. And what is happening right now is we are optimizing the fuel performance of the vessels. We are calling the vessels green, installing a lot of technology, could be hybrid propulsion, and then we're saying now it's a zero emission vessel. But reality, we are increasing the emissions somewhere else in the vessel life cycle. Okay. We just don't know how much. Okay. So Dewey. Yeah. 
That's where you come in. Yeah. <laughs> No, I fully agree we should have data to uh, decide in the design phase which is the right solution. Uh, for example, uh, at Dame, we want to have this standardized platform that we can um, have these modules to make sure it's like zero emission and circular. Yeah, let's uh, talk. <laughs> yeah, but we have to use the data to see in the full life cycle if it's really the best solution. Um, and we're working towards it. Uh, I think it's a big challenge to have all the right data there uh, mm. to include it in the design phase already. Thought, okay, this is the best solution, but uh, we're definitely going there. So that's uh, promising. Definitely. Let, let's then look, John, at the end of the life of a vessel. Where do you, where do, where do you see the recycling element fit into this kind of life, kind of cradle to grave? Sure. If we want to look at cradle to cradle, which is what we're trying to do with circularity, where does the recycling of, an old, of old vessels need to fit into that picture? Because we can do what Fanny was saying and try and sort of prolong, find ways to prolong the life of a vessel. Uh, we can have new ownership structures, but still, at some point, you know, even mobile phones get recycled, tires can be recycled and to some element reused as underfloor matting in a playground or something. So I know the ships are recycled in India, and I'm not going to get into the politics around no, aging in that. I'm not going to get, that's not the purpose of today. But when you break up the ship in the yards in Turkey, in India, or wherever, and that steel gets reused and elements of interior decor get reused, how do you see that fitting into that life cycle picture, sure. uh, or, or even circularity picture. Sure, fair enough. Um, I'm just going to go completely off script straight away and ask people, would you kindly raise your hand if you think that the amount of a ship uh, that's recycled is more than 50% uh, when it gets to the yard? If, if you think in weight terms, of when a ship arrives, in terms of weight, is it more than 50% that gets recycled? Yes. Okay. That's about 50%, funnily enough, of, of you. May I ask you gentlemen at the front, how much do you think of a ship is recycled? I can be a little concerned about how it's measured in the okay. beach. Yeah, yeah, semantics. I would say around 77.5%. Okay, you're on the right track. The, the, the figure, according to a Delft University study, is 97%. So, when you break that down, you think maybe that's not so surprising because most of the ship weight is, is in steel, right? And all of that steel is reused, repurposed. We can discuss the definitions of that later. But <laughs> it goes to a steel mill where it's made into steel bars, steel rods, which is used in construction in the places, the countries where the ships are recycled. So it's not put them back on a ship and sailed across uh, half the world to, to be used. It's used where it's, uh, where it's uh, created. So for me, there's the challenge for the design community is how, what to do with the 3%, the 3% which is waste. Is that what, what can be done to reduce that? I think that would be an interesting conversation. I think in terms of, just, just last thing, just to get, take the economy part of your circular economy, this recycling where it's done, which is in India and Bangladesh and Pakistan, it's a huge local economy built up around these industries. In Alang, there are something like 800 retail outlets which service the ship recycling industry. So it's generators which go to power hospitals and schools where the electricity supply is sometimes uh, unreliable, uh, paneling, furniture, life-saving equipment, you name it, it's there's a shop reselling that, and that all goes back into the uh, into the into, into the circular economy. My definition of it. All right, let me go to Rasmus now because yeah. he raised a yeah. kind of question mark. I there. think it's great that we in the maritime industry is recycling the vessels to this extent. It's really, really amazing. But I think our biggest challenge right now is to do better, and this is where Christopher came in with the modular ship designs. We need to not scrap a ship and recycle it each time we want to. Uh, repurpose because right now in the green transition we're putting a lot of tech in there and if we have to melt it down and recycle it takes a lot of energy yeah so actually going up the tier of circular economy going on repurpose or even avoidance is the most desired way to do it and that's emission savings yeah. it's funny because I was, one of the elements we had on this panel was the batteries 
As you know, we had Frederick from Battery Return, who's going to talk to us about how to extract the battery and even reuse the battery and extract what's inside the battery, potentially under EU law, to make new batteries. So even the, the rare, rare earth metals would be reused in new, in new batteries. And I think that was a definite big... Let me go to Fanny and then to, uh, to you, Christopher. Yeah. I had another argument for, for the rebuilding, and that is also in the transition period we are now. That gives us a great opportunity to quickly test out new equipment, new technologies, and to see how that is working. And uh, to rebuild a vessel will take three, four months or something, build a new one, it will be on the water in two years. So it gives us a, a much better possibility to, to test out that uh, new technology early. And also, since we are in the transition period, we, we don't entirely know yet what are the best uh, um, zero emission uh, equipment for the future. Mm. So uh, you rebuild and then you can repurpose or retrofit in mm. 10 years. So when you know what is really the, the optimal yep. solution. That's another that. argument yeah, for rebuilding. That. Yes, I think it's important in, in our discussion on circularity that we distinguish between closed loop circularity and open loop close circularity. What we are talking about today is clearly clo open loop circularity. And what we see in other industries, including in the car industry, is closed loop circularity combined with new business models where you're basically supplying a service to the industry rather than selling a ship or a product to the industry. So closed loop circularity, I think, is, would be quite new to the industry. So you're basically recollecting your own waste materials and you are rebuilding it either in a modular ship design or at least you're taking care of it from the shipyard again to, to repurpose it and rebuild a new ship. So, But, into, but yeah. uh, re recycling is one thing, but if you look into some shipping segment, we see that oil companies, they do not want to hire uh, tankers, which has an age about 15 years, mm. so you can just get short-term mm. charges. But these vessels are built to last for 20, 25, or 30 years. And another thing, if you want to build a more environmentally friendly vessel, it costs more money. So the capex is yeah. larger. And mm. so I, I understand where the chem chemical companies are coming from and where the oil companies are coming from, because it was the safety argument. But you need to have more than two, one fourth in your head at the same time. And for the sake of the sustainability, we need to tell in the same way that we have to tell the banks that yes. you should move away from just financing standardized vessels. We have to tell the oil companies and the chemical companies yep. that the biggest contribution you can give to environment will be to accept vessels which well, are I have heard the argument that that is already happening. I'm going to go to Dewey, then I'll go over to Rasmus. Dewey. Yeah, so I noticed within Dama we have like these uh, investors and banks that want to invest in our green solutions. Um, and that's not only about selling green solutions, but also leasing them. So we're, I noticed we're moving more towards leasing and selling per you, uh, pay per use. Uh, so we keep the responsibility and ownership of the vessel and also control over the life cycle instead of the user of the vessel. Mm. So that's uh, something I notice within our company. Um, and I hope this is a development that comes throughout the maritime industry more often. But you're going to have to deal with that with the ship owners that want the vessels. Yeah. Very much. And have they got the appetite? And as Elizabeth said, are they being given the appetite because the financing is there for them to take it? I'm going to have a finance discussion later on today, um, looking at a similar angle to this. But I'm one of the ship owners that's going to be on the panel. He told me le recently that we found it easy to get the finance to actually put a retrofitable future fuel design to the yard to start being built. It's a car carrier that's going to have the ability to run off of ammonia or methanol in the future. Yeah. So they're having the capability to design and build a vessel. But he said it was easy to get the finance, it was difficult to find the yard. Okay, well, maybe they should come to us. <laughs> I don't know. Rasmus. I think we need to, um, to look at when is a new vessel better? Right? Yeah. There are certain criteria and scenarios. And when we look at one of the main arguments for building a new vessel and say it's more environmentally friendly, that's when you look at the energy efficiency of the vessel, the propulsion side of it, right? But as we start decarbonizing vessels, putting in different types of fuels and so on, then new is not always better. Because looking in a life cycle perspective, there will be a return on investment environmentally at a certain point where it's more effectively to keep the existing fleet or the existing vessel running, and then retrofitting it. But we don't know because we don't look at the life cycle yet. 
And I think that is, a, again, going back mm. to let's start become data driven. How, how do you see that, John, when, you, when you're looking at steel prices? Because we, we've, we've, we're built into a system, the whole system at the moment is ship owners will look at selling to a cash buyer like GMS based on secondhand steel prices. Low market, high steel prices, you're in demand. Low steel prices, high market, you're, you're, the number of vessels you can get hold of is, is going to drop. How do you see that fitting into, that, into this picture, the sort of secondhand steel prices and the market shift? Do you see that there will be kind of a transition? And then I've got a second question, but I'll ask that in a second. Yeah, I can't think, remember two questions. Mm. Um, <laughs> I mean, in terms of the, the first question, um, I think the idea of running ships a little longer and comparing that with the carbon emissions on a new ship is a very interesting study that should take place. And I think uh, we at GMS, we're not just cash bars, we call ourselves residual asset managers in that way. It's not just about buying, trading the ship and getting it scrapped. It's about looking at it, what it, what it can do, what life it has left. And I think that will become even more important in the future. So I, I can see movements towards that. Um, and just in terms of the market dynamic, buying, selling, there's always a market. It just depends on where it is. It's very high today. Uh, it may have, maybe at the peak, uh, it's, it's been affected by the commodity, spike in commodity prices. It will probably come down at some point. But there will always be ships that will need to be recycled. One uh, group of ships that we haven't seen recycled this year, of course, is container ships. And I think when they, uh, when the markets correct themselves on the box ship market. We're going to see a lot more of those. And, yeah. and they have particular requirements when it comes to recycling. Mm. Uh, my, my second question yeah. is actually more future looking. Yeah. Um, but it kind of relates to the second panel that we've got on sustainability in about 45 minutes. Um, one of the areas I'm going to be looking at with them is to do with the Basel uh, regulations and the inability to take hazardous waste out of Europe. If, and I, and I'm, I was thinking, this is a question I would have asked Frederick if he was here from Battery Retour as well. But when you're looking at new systems on ships like batteries, which are potentially going to be yeah. deemed waste if they're sold to a recycling facility outside Europe, are we going to, if we don't look at this very well, are we going to have a problem where we can't take the ships out of Europe because new technology is potentially prohibiting it? Well, the one thing about uh, battery development, battery power, is that there's, there's not a lot of research done into it. I've checked with my team in Alang, mm. and I said, have you done any studies looking at larger batteries? What will, how, how will you deal with them? And they, they haven't. I mean, th th that work just hasn't been done. Okay. So I don't have a clear answer for you. Maybe you have a better idea. But at the, at, at the moment, yes, it's, 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 it's a hazardous waste because of the lead. Mm and it's treated in that way. So there does need to be some work done on if the batteries are gonna become much bigger, and much more powerful, it will need a, a yeah. review for sure. I, I'm gonna just change track slightly and just go back to you um, with what, when you were talking about the modular, because I know there's some technology providers, when, they, when a ship owner goes to Dewey and says, look, well, I want this wonderful ship, they're gonna to go to the likes of Mann and Bartzilla or whoever, who go say, well, actually, how about you rent the technology and put it onto the ship? So you've got a lease agreement. So the ship is built with steel, but the engine is kind of leased from an engine manufacturer. When it comes to that life cycle analysis, and maybe I'll come to you again, John, to get your thoughts on this or any of the other panel. When it comes to the, the end of life of a vessel or the repurposing of a vessel, how do you see that contractual arrangement having to change? Because the new owner may, not, may say, well, I don't need a contract on that. So the old owner may have to buy out the engine yeah. just to be able to sell the engine. Yeah. First of all, I think that when we're beginning to see this change, we'll begin to see that it is not just the engine or the boiler or individual components that will be supplied as a service. I think it will be significantly more common to see the ship being supplied as a service. So at the end of life, I also expect to see that this will entail with a closed loop recycling. So the, the whole ship and the whole, all the components will be reused and, 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 and repurposed and put into new ships again. I think it's, it's, we are sitting somewhere between two, two chairs at the moment when we're discussing this. Um, we're still pretty much dealing with the, with the world of yesterday while we are beginning to be able to see that new business models are mm. coming in. Um, so I, think, I think it will change quite a lot in, in, yeah. in next. I think one of the things we have experienced is one of the prohibitors of our true circular 
um, economy and the maritime industry is the need for ownership. And that's because, they, as we see it, um, they need to resell the vessel and have little risk. You know, you can resell it easily. And now you're saying in your opening statement that uh, you see that we're going to run into a smaller secondary market. So this should be an excellent opportunity to actually start looking at new business model, sure. to start looking circular, because now you probably don't have the same pool for the ownership uh, later on. Um, I think, first of all, when we begin to look into the new fuels, whether we call them zero carbon, alternative, or whatever, or let's just say new, new fuels, we often see that these new fuels are committed on long-term purchase agreements. So we are already committing us, let's say, 15 years, 10 years, 20 years on a fuel agreement. And often this is also accomplished by a long-term cargo contract. So suddenly we are now in a system where we are not open, openly expecting to, to sell the ship in an, in an asset game. So now we, are, now we can begin to long-term plan, at least to the, to the duration of, of either the fuel offtake agreement or the cargo ag agreement. And I would expect these two to be matched so they have the same maturity. So I think that the whole, the whole concept is, is increasing with introduction of uh, green corridors, purchasing fuel agreements, and, uh, and, and long-term commitments both on the cargo and the fuel side. So, well, Where does export finance kind of fit into this as a sort of, I wouldn't say incentive provider, but uh, well, actually, first, let, 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 let's look at the role of export finance in general, not just uh, in Norway, but the role of export finance is there as a sort of security to some point. point. So it's a, it's a kind of encouraging the right kind of business yeah. sort of yeah, develop. Yeah, Be, being a, a government-owned provider of financing, yeah. it is, of course, of major concern for us to, to be sure to finance the, 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 the yeah. Technology it would be like and loan guarantees that would... Yeah, but both financing and guarantees of uh, Norwegian uh, equipment going for, for yeah. exports. Yeah. And it's very important that, that our transaction taking the necessary uh, precautions with respect both to, to uh, environment uh, and uh, social uh, so you, risks. You get given a kind of remit from the government to some certain extent to you to say, look, this is what we expect you to be focusing on for the next... Well, the, the main purpose is, of course, to, yeah. to encourage uh, financing of Norwegian export transactions. Yeah. But we have, a, 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 amongst other, we have a policy for promoting the sustainability goals um, and then trying to, to give incentives for transactions which are, are um, uh, high on... on uh, um, on achieving the sustainability yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, 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 I think that these long-term contracts on special fuels, yeah, it's, it's marketing for those which are into it. It will never become the rule. Because if you as a cargo owner, industrial company, takes on too many long-term contracts, you get in trouble as well with your um, uh, owners because you're not allowed to take on too much obligations in your financial system. As a cargo owner, do you mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah if you're Yara, yeah. if you're Heidelberg or Elisjöpe, yeah. whoever, you can just take on a limited number of, of uh, such contracts. But when we are speaking about bags, um, they are also looking for the good sustainability criteria to tell that this is actually a green ship. This ship deserves a lower interest rate. And at the moment, the banks are not sure because you can come up with a nice test. Mm. It shows that ah, it performed excellent under the EDI, mm. but it might be the worst ship which has ever been built. Mm. So the banks need something to tell about the performance, the full performance. And that would be, how long can you expect to use it for? How much less fuel will you be burning? Or there, is it better regarding noise for life at sea? Yeah, you can take the full list. Mm. Wait, wait. I'm going to put the shipyard then. How do you see this all? Because you, you, your role is a sort of sustainability, life cycle kind of coordinator. Yeah. The word coordinator implies that there's a lot of different influences coming to you from financing regulations yeah. your own stakeholders shareholders you know it, it must be coming quite a, um, a not confusing but a, a very complex 
web that you're having to work your way through. Yeah, but it's really exciting because there's so much popping up, like everywhere, and you only have to combine it. And then, actually, I'm really happy with all these developments. Also, like with the life cycle assessments, I think it would be really nice for like banks and investors to have these life cycle assessments that they can, based on data, can say, okay, this vessel operates way more efficient than uh, when it's refitted compared to mm. when it's not refitted. Um, um, and I think, so I look at my company within Dame, you have all these developments in different departments. So we have uh, the refit uh, department, repair. Uh, all these departments are coming together now so that we can form this full life cycle. Uh, and that's really needed because we have the regulation changing and the technology changes. So we have to uh, connect all the dots with suppliers internally and with our clients mm. uh, and make this value chain uh, circular. <laughs> But do you go, have you started to look back as far as saying even the steel, where do we get the steel from? What's the life cycle picture of this steel? Where is it made? How is it made? Yeah. Now, what's the emission picture of the steel? How does that steel foundry make the steel? Uh, you could even take that back even to the, uh, the iron ore if you wanted yeah. to. Then all of a sudden, ironically, you're back looking at the emissions from the ships that carried the iron ore to make the steel to make a ship. It becomes... How far back does this life cycle picture need to yeah. go for it to be fully life cycle? Well, uh, then we go there, then I go to Rasmus yeah. three first. <laughs> yeah, um, we're now having like these conversations with our uh, steel suppliers and they have like these environmental product declarations where they have information about uh, what's in their steel and uh, uh, like the emissions and stuff. So we're getting there, <laughs> but maybe you have more to say about it. I think on the life cycle, it's important we go all the way back. Yeah. Uh, we need to uh, be able to argue and measure the emissions all the way back. Now, yeah. that's not practical possible, and that's why we use life cycle uh, inventory databases where you'll have the most common uh, streams of materials in certain, uh, work okay. in certain flows. Mm. But if you do something better than standard, then it's about you need to measure it. And this is where recycled steel has a lot of potential. We just don't know if we do it today because we don't measure it. Well, let me go to the recycled steel then, John, because if, I'm a, if I remember rightly, the Lloyd's, uh, sorry, the classification societies, um, they have a strict requirement on the quality of the steel that is used in new buildings. Yes. I should actually do it. That's right, isn't it? So you can't just put any old steel into. It's got to have certain yeah. uh, brittle certain, degrees, certain elements yeah. of, of strength yeah. and that. If I'm, I'm not mistaken, recycled steel isn't meeting that requirement. Th th that's my understanding. I'm not a naval architect. That's my understanding. And I think that's where there's a little bit of a question over what a closed loop is. Um, because are we really saying that the steel from ship recycling should be used in shipbuilding? Well, shipbuilding takes place in Korea, Japan, and China. And ship recycling takes place in India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. So, yep. you, so there's a, a carbon cost of, of transporting it. If you're going to do that, and I don't think it's even possible, is it? Anyway, you wouldn't use recycled steel for no, a new building. No, we try to do it ourselves now. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. It's much better that the steel is used in the economy where it's produced. Yeah. yeah. So let, that's why I think that the, the, if the closed loop is, the steel is part of that, there's a, there's a kind of a question over that, how that could work. Yep then we need to say, okay, then we need to look modular because if we cannot recycle yes. the steel, we need to repurpose it. So that calls for a modular approach or a, yeah, a platform approach or retrofitting approach because 60% of, in a typical vessel, 60% of the manufacturing emissions is from steel. Yes. Yeah. So we really need to start thinking that way. But re reusing the steel is much easier for shipbuilding than in other industries. Because when you scrap the vessel, you know that it's steel. Uh, in most of the recollections uh, uh, of steel and steel-like products, you get everything. So it can just be used for strong beams in buildings, basically. But with shipbuilding, we know that it comes from a vessel, and it's pure steel. So it's much easier to reuse it. So we, we do not really have that argument. And then back to, is it really complicated to make a good sustainability report? I don't think so. I think that you could make a two-page report when you build a new vessel. Then you can tell 
everything which we need to know. I'm always saying to our CEO that uh, CEOs don't read uh, memos which are longer than two pages. And CEOs are quite smart, so nobody else reads them either. So it's instead of trying to make it very complicated, these LCA things, you can just put it into a two-pager and then you get what you need for the taxonomy, then you get what you need for the bags. Um, I promised to, to make a suggestion for how it could be done a few months ago. I have a little bit of a backlog, but uh, it's not really complicated. But that could be a call to action because EU is already introducing the solution called Product Environmental Footprint, PEF. And that is to make a short report form where you use life cycle assessment in a structured format. So that calls for perhaps cooperation. Let's try and look at that and see, can we make some category rules so we can use the PEF format to uh, assess vessels in the future? So we have a common taxonomy, a common understanding of when is a vessel zero emission? Because when you look at the entire life cycle of a vessel, a vessel zero emission is not possible. Just saying. No, so we, we, we've got to admit that there is some element of there that isn't going to be as green or as sustainable as it ideally we want it to be. There's going to be inefficiencies in that cycle all the time so that we, we've got to be aware of that. But how much do you think from in terms of that modular element that you're dis discussing, where do you think that's really going to start? How do you think this kind of modularity could start? I think, first of all, we need... Uh, I, I, clearly, I don't agree with you on the, on, on, on the fuel purchasing side. It's basically, to my understanding, it's a question about counterparty risk. Clearly, you need to have a, a higher uh, credit worth than if you're doing long-term contracts, but that can be solved. So, but from my understanding, this is, this is largely a question about business models. It is largely a question about who you are, what you do, and how you do it. So in, in today's shipping market, it looks quite difficult because the asset game is still prevailing in most, uh, most areas. So, but if, if we do actually begin to see this new, new type of asset player, and we all know that a lot of ship owners like to talk about going asset light. Asset light basically just means trading other people's assets um, and not placing your own equity in these vessels. That is, that is the concept. So, if we are creating a new, let's say, green, long-term, optimized charter model, uh, basically, this is what, we, what, what I've labeled vessel as a service in the past. But, but it is clearly making a system change to, to many of the elements that we're used to seeing in the, in the industry. Mm. And yeah, so I, I would argue that this is coming with the introduction of, of green corridors and, and new green fuels. But do you think the cargo owners are, the, are a key influence here in that? The, the cargo owners would like to be able to get a, a certain pr percentage of their, of their cargo need transported on ships that are less CO2 emitting green or less, mm. who knows. So um, we need long-term contracts, both on the fuel side and on the, and on the cargo side. And this is basically, we are creating the ship into something that could become a, a, a bond structure, basically. So very different from what we have today. Yeah. Yeah. I, I spoke um, last week to Heidelberg Cement and Fjellesjöpitz, who are giving a 15-year contract to With Orca, it's for my podcast. And, and they were saying, we, we needed to be able to offer a 15-year contract for the owner to be able to put the energy in and the effort to find the type of vessel that we want to have. They also said we'll form a joint venture and we will go and look for the fuel. So they've now found a fuel supplier just for the one vessel. So it's not a system change, it's just for the one vessel. So I appreciate yeah. what you're saying there. But it's for, a, I think, a three or maybe five year period. It's not for the length of the yeah. charter for the ship, but it is a kind of long term fixed price, so they, they're guaranteeing. But they recognize that the fuel is going to cost a lot more. So they've got all the technology in there, including Fletner rotors in the design, so that it won't use as much fuel. I joke to say that you know, you're using compressed gas, but you're doing it, or compressed hydrogen gas, but you're doing it in a way that you won't use any compressed hydrogen gas, because the design is such that it will be able to not use it to any fuel at some point. So there, 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 there are elements of this, but this is being done in Norway. This is being done, providing there is Innova's support coming in here. So all of this circularity, all of this, this, these changes, all of this drive, I keep, it keeps on coming back to governments. It keeps on coming back to being able to kick this off with that kind of support. So that's why I'm looking at you. 
<laughs> yeah, and I wish I could have a, a, a larger toolbox. Uh, we are uh, currently uh, looking into developing a policy for green financing, but which uh, Elizabeth uh, uh, Christopher just talked about to define what is actually a green vessel or a green ship, and then taking into account, for example, the whole supply chain. It's mm. a pity that the battery guy isn't here. Uh, how is the cobalt for, for the battery source, etc. It, it's the, the, the assessment, it's much more complicated than just looking at the emissions mm. uh, during the operational phase. It's, uh, it's, it's actually quite challenging, uh, and that's why, unfortunately, this policy isn't, <laughs> isn't there yet. Um, uh, but yeah, we we really would like to to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, to but you, do, you, do you agree that you know to create this shift, even that modularity that you're talking about, the green corridors, that there has to be that political support to underscore that the commercial element is not going to do it on its own. I think it, it depends on whether we are looking at only shipping, shipping first, or whether we are looking more broadly because it, we can clearly see that in in most geographies we are not able to scale a sufficient offtake of an alternative fuel for the shipping industry to a scale of production where the prices come down. But if you can team up with, with onshore or land-based industries that have a regular offtake of the, of, the, of the fuel in question, then we can maybe scale it to a point where the price begins to come down. At the moment, it is super expensive, so it's two to five times as expensive mm. as additional fuels. So the business case is basically awful, uh, or it, it is not there. And um, so we, that needs to change, and that needs scale and standardization. So I, I think it's, it's possible to expect that the EU programs or public-private partnerships could, could, could help us uh, in, in this transition. But it could also be uh, together with big industry players from other yeah. industries. Yeah. And but from, sorry, go on, but, but, but it, um, it, it could be that uh, these alternative fuels uh, actually is the biggest push for making more environmentally friendly vessels. Because these alternative fuels are so expensive that when your customers and EU are pushing you for a reduction in carbon intensity, and uh, we have the CII, uh, it pays off to build a much better vessel, yes. which has much lower resistance, which are utilizing the wind. Because that is ch super cheap, cheap compared to the fuels. Exactly. And the fuels might not be available anyhow. Yeah, yeah. But how about in terms of the circularity element here, John, where we look at things coming and reusing? We've, we've touched yeah. on the steel, but what about the electronics? What about the cabling? What about all of that equipment sure. on a ship? Is there going to be a scenario in the future where we don't just see everything kept in India, for example, but India starts exporting back to the shipyards, maybe not the steel, but some of the other components, the electrical components, some of the engine components. Maybe the engine manufacturers say, actually, no, there's elements of there we can reuse, refurbish. But I know you and I have talked in the past about how, from an, engineer's, from an engine perspective, elements of it can be repurposed. But obviously, in a large vessel, it's difficult to take out one element and replace it until the vessel is actually sent to be recycled. So is there going to be a market where India starts becoming part of that recycling outside of India? Um, I don't think so, is, no? is the straight answer, because uh, all of the things you described where the engines are refurbished, repaired, looked at, and then they go into the Indian economy, and that's where they're yeah. actually needed. Um, I think a, a more interesting question is, uh, how to work with charterers to engage with ships that are running, you know, a little bit over their expected life because they've been, you know, repaired, repaired and maintained very well. This is what you're talking about. There needs to be a commercial understanding that if charterers faced with two options, one is a 15-year-old ship, one is an 18-year-old ship, which one do you think they'll go for, right? But then there needs to be a case where you say, no, this we can build a sustainability argument around this older ship. It's been maintained, we've got the documentation, it's all in class, everything. And then there will be a, a commercial case for extending the life of, of ships, I think. But it, yeah, in terms of use, I don't see the, the need, personally, I don't see the, the, the crushing need to get all the equipment back into new ships, because it already is being going into a circular economy where it's needed. Yeah. So, you know. Yeah, Yui yeah. and Rasmus. Um, 
I think indeed about talking about India and recycling there, should it go back to, uh, for example, uh, our yard? I think we should do it ourselves more. So we have the full responsibility. And also, if we don't want to use raw materials, we should also recycle ourselves and be our own supplier. Or uh, So yeah, that's how I see it, <laughs> that we have to do it ourselves. So, yeah. Yeah. I read somewhere that in the car industry, about 60% of components going back in, 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 in when you have a car repaired is remanufactured components. Right? If you take it over to the maritime industry, we have one of the highest uh, regulated areas within maintenance of the vessels because of the reliability issue. Now, looking at the end of life, I would bet to say there are components there that has a high quality, high lifespan left because they're being maintained so well. And that's looking at the automotive industry. They don't have the same requirements. So if they can do it, so can we. I mean, isn't it the case that at Honda, um, when they're developing a new product or service, it goes through some kind of pre-assessment as, as to how it will be recycled or how sustainable it will be? It, does that happen in shipping? Are, are engine manufacturers thinking about recycling when they Unfortunately, uh, not to our knowledge. Okay. Uh, you don't look at the life cycle. You manufacture to the lowest cost, highest quality, and then you sell it. Right. And now we're talking uh, energy efficiency as an extra element, but you actually don't look at the benefits of the recycling because if you look at the life cycle of a product or a vessel, you can actually get uh, credits back when you recycle or repurpose the components. Because when you look at the life cycle, this is an excellent way to lower the emissions of the vessel to have a repurposed recycling plan when you manufacture it. Yes. That will lower the life cycle emissions. So that, that's a kind of incentive to. Yeah. yeah, I have a question. I don't know if it's for John or do you, but we have like the inventory of hazardous materials. But are there other really good inventory lists on the vessels when they're being built that you can use? Uh, how, how good are they? Can, uh, how detailed are they? Um, or could they IHMs. be increased? Yeah. What? Inventories I, I, of hazardous materials, I, I as can, an example. Okay, yeah. I'll start and then you can. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So uh, every new ship as it's built now has an IHM delivered as part of the uh, delivery process. And it's, the IHM is conducted by the yard and the mm. class society they certify. It. Um, for most ships that are already trading, you have to get get someone in and, and produce an IHM and that stays with the ship, it's yeah. a technical document. So, but you know, an IHM only goes so far. It's, a, yeah. it's an indication of, you know, where there could be hazardous materials and it's actually up to the recycler when they get the ship, if they say, for example, they know that they get that gasket has asbestos in it and that gasket has asbestos mm -hmm. in it, the chances are we need to remove the, the, all of this piping mm -hmm. under, you know, enclosed mm -hmm. conditions. So the IHMs are very good indicators of uh, you know, where substances have been tested and certified as hazardous, but it's, you need to have some um, experienced interpretation of what that means on the ship when you take it apart. Mm. I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, or I was wondering also, could they be further developed in order right. to, to oh, okay. yeah. increase the, the possibilities for reuse and recycling? Well, th there is part of the IHM regulation is that it should come with an IHM maintenance. Mm. So the ship owner is, uh, is required actually to document all of the products that come onto the ship all during its lifetime and yep. blah, blah, blah. That's the theory. Mm. Um, so does it, let, let's so put that to Dewey then. From, yeah. from the cradle element then, looking at what you were saying then, Fanny, can we build, can we design the ships with an idea that everything in that ship has got a, light, not, not a hazardous inventory, no. but a life cycle yeah. inventory? Yeah. So you can look at everything on the ship and you've got a picture of its potential life cycle. Mm. Every element from all the electronics on the bridge to the equipment in the engine room, the steel, of course. Um, all of the elements, every single element that you are putting into the design, that supplier's list that you get, which is huge, I've seen exactly. one, it's yeah. huge, yeah. but nonetheless, each individual supplier could be told, we want to have a picture. So some sort of format where they give a picture to the shipyard, to the designer of the life cycle ability of the elements that they're providing into the design, into the build. So then you can give that to the ship owner who's got not only the hazardous material, no. yep. but has got that pure sort of life cycle element that then will stay with that vessel like the IHM does mm -hmm. um, in the same way. So when it becomes 
end of life in that respect or modular and you can look at elements that can be sold on. Yep. People can look at that vessel individually, individual items, say, well, actually, before we sell it for recycling in India, let's remove that, let's yeah. remove that and reuse that and reuse yeah. that. So there is, so that's starting to be modular yes. in a way, isn't it? So have you looked at that? Yeah. Um, and it's more like on a digital, uh, mm -hmm. if you look at digitalization. So if we design a vessel, you have the vessel like in 3D uh, digitally. Mm. Uh, and we can also add all the parts and components in there. Um, and if to that part is connected, what is in there, lifetime, like if everything is in there, you have this like digital twin of your vessel with the information about the life cycle. It's, I'm not sure if we can do it right now, but it, it's definitely something we can work towards. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Rasmus. And then let's work together because at Reflow we have the digital system. We do life cycle assessment on new uh, vessels and existing vessels. And we have a granular understanding of the circular um, um, performance or the circular opportunities, but also the life cycle of the major components on the vessel. Yeah. So maybe we should have like this circular passport with every yeah. vessel. Yeah. It's yeah. the a material be break. Great. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Do you think this is a something in, in the system perspective? No, I, 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 th I think it. Uh, so you were looking very doubtful then. Yeah. <laughs> but um, um, okay, the devils are in the details. At the same time, you need to move a little bit up, and of course, in the way that the existing fleet is operating, if it had been operating at design speed, uh, the shipbuilding part would have been seven to eight percent of the emissions, but the fleet are not operating at the design and it's too much import. So today, maybe the emissions from building the world's fleet is approximately 15%. When we start to talk about more energy efficient vessels, where we might reduce energy consumption mm. with up to 50%, shipbuilding will be 30%. Then suddenly it, it becomes very important. And I, I think that it's an excellent idea Still, it's possible to keep it at two pages. The whole thing about the vessel. And then you can, can get the document. Just deliver it to the bank. Yeah. And my thought was that when you design the vessel, you do that two pager. Then you go to the, your banks, and you get half a percent less interest rate. Maybe that's the maximum that you could, uh, can get. And then, you put the vessel into traffic after one year you report and if you have achieved what you promised you keep that interest rate if you have failed you have to pay the normal rate a simple uh, self-declaration system and uh, the really good thing about it is that it put the ship owners back as an adult because IMO authorities they tend to treat ship owners like they are small children in the nursery. And the ship owners try always to f blame everybody else for too high fuel consumption and so on. Well, I, th I think history has proven sometimes that the ship owners need to be policed. So treating them as adults is one thing, but having a good oversight of what they're doing is still likely to be a necessity to keep them on the, uh, on the straight and narrow. So I appreciate, appreciate what, what you're saying there, but as we got two minutes, well, we've got one minute now, sorry. So in just at the, la the last minute then, I'm going to go back to you, Christopher. And actually, no, before I do, I had a quick question for you, Dewey, in terms of, from the cradle perspective, as a land-based element of the maritime industry, your emissions surely fall into land-based emission accounting, do they? Yeah. yeah. Do you look at that in, term yeah, in terms of, going back to what Rasmus was saying, because this is what I picked you up, because you said, you know, you look at the emissions from the shipping company when you're looking at scope three emissions. So when you're provide, if you're going to be providing the emissions perspective of shipbuilding, do you feed that in, do you see that being part of the accounting into the shipping industry, which is a floating, in terms of the floating asset, or remaining in terms of shipyard accounting land-based? That was just a quick answer, because I've got another one for... <laughs> <laughs> um. I don't know. Yeah, I think we should connect everything together. So it's not yeah. the one or the other, it's all connected. So we Okay, that, like, that, there's a question about double accounting there. I think uh, it's an excellent question because part of your upstream emissions, what you pass on, yeah. is the vessel. 
So you shouldn't be held accountable for all the emissions you generate. Yeah. You should account for them and then document what you're passing on. Okay. That's why it's so important. Okay, and I'm going to go back to you for this for the final word here, Christopher, because I, I, again, I just want to lo look at this system change that you, that, that you are um, talking about and the change to an element in the, in the ownership model yes. here. Let me put this back onto the shoulders of Danish ship finance then. Do the finances have the capacity and the willpower to be part of that change? Yeah, we are looking into how we can do it, but uh, no, nothing has been, been built yet, so it is still yeah. uh, an ambition and a, and a hope and a dream, so to speak, but it, uh, it is something we have worked on and we have worked on it for quite some time. So there, 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 there is, do you think there's going to be a growing appetite? Yeah, for sure. For that, sure. For that yeah. change? Yeah. Good. Bang on zero. Couldn't have timed that better. Thank you for the quick answer. Can I say thank you to our panel here of Rasmus Fanny, John, Dewey, Elizabeth, and Christopher. Thank you very much. And I'll be back in 15 minutes where we're going to talk about how we speed up the transition, the sustainability of shipping. So 15 minutes, we'll have another debate. Thank you.